Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a really great pleasure to inaugurate our series of uh, seminars with our external speakers with uh, Alex Pollen. This is, uh, you know, also a special instance of our neuroloquia, which uh, exceptionally take place on Fridays this week uh, for Alex rather than on Thursdays, but it's also more broadly the first uh, HD seminar by an external speaker. So we are really very, very, very happy and honored to welcome on this occasion uh, Alex Pollen. I really would have not thought of a better guest to inaugurate our series. And um, also very grateful that Alex uh, accommodated this visit uh, uh, in the aftermath of a number of uh, COVID related pandemic uh, changes of flights. Uh, and so, again, very grateful for. Uh, accommodating that. So just very few words of introduction because Alex uh, 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 achievements don't need a lot of introduction, but it's just a pleasure to do so. Um, so Alex uh, started off with uh, a bachelor in Harvard and then moved uh, to Oxford for his master. I think it's also a very nice combination of training uh, that bridges environmental science first to neuroscience. And uh, during the time, he was also in our idea of uh, the Rhodes Scholarship, which I'm sure you will know is one of the most prestigious scholarships in the world. And he then moved uh, to Stanford. And then uh, to San Francisco, where he trained in the lab of Arnold Christian. And during the time, he uh, contributed to really fundamental uh, discoveries and insights about uh, what makes us human, including with the identification of uh, out of radial glia. And uh, he then went on to establish uh, his own lab as an assistant professor of neurology at the University of, Cali of, of, of California, San Francisco, in the Mission Bay campus. And already, as a PI, he has uh, yet again uh, provided a seminar contribution to the field, the most recently, as you have read in Nature, with uh, a dissection of the evolution of uh, inhibitory neurons uh, in the primate cerebral. Throughout, he has been uh, at the leading edge of uh, the development and applications of new technologies to inquire into the evolution of uh, the human brain. And this is also one of the main reasons why his research is so relevant and aligns uh, uh, so nicely with uh, a lot of the themes that we are pursuing uh, in the Neurogenomics Research Center and more broadly at UN Technopole. So without further ado, I leave the podium to him, thanking him again, and it's really an enormous pleasure to welcome you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for the kind introduction. And, uh, you know, it's a special privilege for me to be visiting an institute and program dedicated to neurogenetics. And uh, these interests are really close to my heart. Um, today, I want to talk to you about um, some contrasting developmental mechanisms that can underlie the evolution of entirely new cell types. And let's see if this will work. We've got the computer running up there to accommodate the Zoom link. Um, so dramatic changes in brain structure and function have evolved along the lineage leading to humans. Our brains are at the, over a thousand times larger than the rodent brain and have tripled in size in just the last few million years. Um, as Giuseppe mentioned in my training, I was really focused on genetic, molecular, and developmental mechanisms that could contribute to brain expansion and cortical expansion itself. And using single cell RNA sequencing, we were able to identify specific marker genes and signaling pathways that distinguish these uh, outer radial glia neural stem cells um, or basal radial glia from those at the ventricle. Um, but the Genes and pathways that we found were shared across primates and to try to find human specific changes. I generated pluripotent stem cells and brain organoids um, from human and chimpanzee and we were able to identify some human specific signaling pathway changes and quantitative increase in mTOR activation in human outer radial glia. Um, as I started my own group, I took a step back and we thought more about some of the special features of brain evolution and one of the major features is that not all brain regions change equally. The, let's see if the laser pointer. Um, so the gray matter of the neocortex, the underlying white matter 
and the striatum have expanded disproportionately compared with other regions like the olfactory bulb or ventral midbrain. And oh, can you go back? Um, go back. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm trying to go back to the other side. So um, we in my group, we've become really interested in how this process of unequal scaling combined with new functional requirements um, may drive cell type specific adaptations to the large brain cellular ecology of uh, human and other non-human primate brains. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you about how do new cell types evolve in the primate brain. And here's a picture of one of the cell types that Matthew, who's here in the audience, identified the cell type um, that lines the striatum. And um, let's see. expresses some of the biosynthetic machinery for making dopamine. And so how is this cell type specified in primates and not rodents? How did, where did it come from developmentally? And ultimately, we'd like to think about how do qualitatively new neurons integrate into existing circuits? And so I'll talk about three different scenarios of cell type evolution today. Um, next slide. And um, the first one would involve an entirely new initial class of neurons um, that is qualitatively distinct and generated early in development by progenitor cells with different gene expression networks. Um, in the second scenario, I'll talk about um, a conserved initial class of neurons that looks similar to that which is seen ancestrally is moved to a new location where it may acquire new gene expression programs and new functions post-mitotically and later in development. And in the third scenario, um, I'll talk about um, what I think is the most common in recent human evolution since our divergence from other apes. And you know, to take a, a play on Sean Carroll's quote, this would involve teaching an old cell type new tricks, where changes in gene regulatory networks in otherwise conserved cell types could lead to specialized functions. Um, next slide. And today I'll mainly focus on inhibitory neurons. Over 100 years ago, Ramon E. Cajal appreciated the increased morphological diversity of inhibitory neurons in primate and the human brain, even speculating that these were connected to the functional superiority of the human brain. Um, indeed, there's an increased proportion of inhibitory neurons in human and primate cortex compared with rodents and also in, in dorsal thalamus compared with rodents. Um, and recently, Fenna Creenan and Steve McCarroll's lab discovered these primate-specific TAC3 striatal interneurons um, that are inhibitory. And there have also been multiple reports of more neurons that expressed tyrosine hydroxylase, a rate-limiting enzyme in dopamine and catecholamine production in human white matter and striatum compared with uh, other non-human primates and especially with rodents. Um, in addition, these inhibitory neurons migrate long distances to their final destinations, so they might be particularly impacted by the increased duration and increased overall size of the brain during development. Um, it's a little tough. Um, there's some animations here, but I, I don't have control over the slides. So the neurons from the MGE in blue are the major contributor to the cortex, and then neurons from the CGE uh, are also contributors to the cortex. Um, the neurons from the LGE are mainly associated with making the projection neurons of the striatum, as well as uh, multiple types of olfactory bulb uh, inhibitory neurons. And with Matthew, um, we wanted to ask. Um, are these initial classes of inhibitory neurons first specified early in development um, shared between primates and rodents, or can we already see distinctions at these early stages of development? And um, so there's Matthew here and also in the audience. And you know, as one of the first grad students, it's been great having Matthew as a real eye for patterns in the computational and histological data. So with Matthew, we surveyed the... Let's see if get this now. I'm not sure. Okay, well, we surveyed the um, germinal zone origins of these inhibitory neurons as well as their destinations using single cell RNA sequencing. And we um, uh, did this across the span of cortical neurogenesis. Um, here's a projection of about 100,000 inhibitory neurons colored by the region from where they were sampled. Um, but organized based on transcriptional similarity. And you can see most of the uh, um, germinal zone neurons are over here, 
And uh, um, next slide, please. And if we cluster these by transcriptional similarity, um, we can see that these are mainly the progenitors, which cluster by um, cell cycle progression. But uh, next slide. If we um, look at the postmitotic neurons, Matthew could identify these discrete initial classes of postmitotic neurons. And we're calling these initial classes because they're later partitioned into one or many terminal classes by a process of postmitotic fate refinement. But at these early stages of development, we don't yet see um, a partition um, related to the terminal classes that they will generate. Instead, the transcriptional variation is mainly related to maturation. For example, the, okay. Well, we can go next. Next slide. Um, and so we wanted to ask this simple question, um, to what extent are these initial classes of inhibitory neurons conserved between primates and rodents? And we did this a few different ways at the level of individual cells, as well as at the level of clusters. For simplicity, I'll show a comparison at the level of clusters. You can already see that the mouse inhibitory neurons form a very similar manifold. So how correlated are these clusters? Um, we look across marker genes, we in general see one-to-one -one homology. Um, but there was one case that really stood out where there's um, two populations of MGE um, neurons that express CRAB-P1 in primates, but only a single population in rodents. And one of these was also defined by the expression of TAC3 and other markers um, from this recently discovered uh, adult population of TAC3 striatal interneurons that Fenacrenin showed represents about 30% of the striatal interneurons in primates, but is not found in rodents or carnivores, and thus likely evolved within the last 90 million years. And so our developmental data gave us the chance to look at how early in development are evolutionarily novel cell types specified. And um, in the adult data, this terminal class was very similar transcriptionally to the TH and PV positive striatal interneurons. Um, and indeed, in the, in the um, developmental data, um, does anyone have a laser pointer? Um, I was usually use the cursor of the mouse, but OK. Thank you. Um, so the math class, so these TAC3 neurons are very transcriptionally similar to the class that ultimately generates the TH and PV cells, but they already express distinct uh, neuropeptides and neurotransmitter receptors. And then uh, next slide, they also distinctly express transcription factors um, like LHX8 at the MGE septum boundary that are associated with uh, the production of cholinergic neurons, but transcriptionally they look quite distinct from the initial class that makes cholinergic neurons. Um, next slide. So how early are they specified? Is it postmitotically? Could we already see a gene co-expression signature in the progenitors? So look at this. Matthew looked at the co-expression of uh, markers of the TAC3 class, as well as the MAF class and shared markers in progenitor cells. Uh, next slide. At uh, G1 and G2M. And these edges represent significant uh, co-expression patterns. So we could already see co-expression of some of the cell type specific markers for TAC3 or MAF with the shared markers at these early stages of development. And then we went back to the tissue to test whether we could see these co-expression signatures. Next slide. And um, we looked along the MGE both at the ventricle and in the subventricular zone. And in the subventricular zone, we could see co-expression of uh, TAC3, this neuropeptide that marks the cell type, with several other markers um, and CRAB-P1, suggesting that indeed this gene co-expression network already is present and the progenitor cells. And then we wondered, is there a spatial bias or even a zone that produces the TAC3 distinct from the MAF? Um, we had seen some co-expression of transcription factor signatures um, with the cholinergic neurons. And what Matthew found is that the progenitor cells that express, next slide, that express these markers and um, the newborn neurons were, um, there was not a discrete location producing MAF versus TAC3, but there was a bias where the TAC3 newborn neurons were more likely to appear caudally um, across the MGE. Um, as these neurons continue to differentiate, these co-expression signatures strengthen and, and more genes are included. 
And we could use these as markers of the dispersion of these sister classes in the striatum and evaluate the extent to which their partitions there are already mixed. Um, next slide. And um, we could see, um, you know, in a single plane, the yellow cells represent co-expression of multiple TAC3 markers and the, blue, the green cells represent the MAF class. We could see these evenly dispersed in the striatum. Next slide. Um, as well along a roster caudal axis with, with, with no spatial bias. So these are specified very early. And to look next slide at the um, gene regulatory networks that specify these, we did uh, analysis called Regulon analysis, where we look at the co-expression between transcription factors and their putative uh, downstream targets based on transcription factor motifs. And unsurprisingly, the MAF class was distinguished by networks related to the MAF transcription factor. Um, as well as some other transcription factors like MEF2C involved in neuronal maturation and in the cortex, um, you know, PV specification. But uh, interestingly, the TAC3 class was distinguished by multiple um, regulons involving early response genes, suggesting differences in calcium activation or potentially neuronal activity at these early stages. Um, so we have this model where um, an ancestral CRAB P1 expressing MGE progenitor is partitioned by distinct transcription factors to express um, different neuropeptides and functionally distinct, next slide, um, um, functionally distinct um, neurotransmitter receptors, um, suggesting that this cell type is um, talking to and listening to different neurons in a circuit. And to underscore how early this um, occurs, um, the MAF class goes on to specify well-conserved PV and TH stridal interneurons, but we don't see any signatures of those classes at this stage when we can already see um, the TAC3 neurons. Um, so <clears throat> this, um, for us, would represent an entirely new initial class specified early in development. How common is this across all the inhibitory neuron classes? This stood out to us. So Matthew constructed a taxonomy of inhibitory neurons organized by the um, predicted birthplace, transcription factor signatures, and birth date. And the TAC3 class was really an exceptional case, the only example that was qualitatively distinct um, between primates and rodents. And if that's the case, then um, how then how 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 do neurons diversify in the primate brain or what might explain this morphological diversity? Next slide. Um, um, so here there was a surprising cell type to find in the neocortex. I mentioned that the vast majority of cortical inhibitory neurons come from MGE and CGE. But uh, in our sampling, we found multiple classes that appear to come from the dorsal part of the LGE, lateral ganglionic eminence. Um, next slide. In addition, when we looked at the data, so here's you know the CGE and MGE cells um, relatively homogeneously distributed across the roster caudal axis of the cortex. Um, next slide. But the um, Dorsal LGE-derived interneurons were um, enriched in the prefrontal cortex. And so we wanted to track this down further, what's going on. Um, and when we looked back at this heat map of correlations with rodents, one of these classes, the mice 2 pac 6 class, um, showed its strongest correlation actually with um, adult-born granule cells of the olfactory bulb. Um, next slide. And so what are olfactory bulb-like neurons doing in the cortex, and how did they get there? Um, normally, these olfactory bulb neurons are generated in the dorsal LGE and then the adult SVZ and migrate in parenchymal chains along the rostral migratory stream to the olfactory bulb. And um, we presumed their, um, you can just advance if you, we presumed their dorsal LGE origin by the expression of markers, uh, low expression of CGE markers, um, high expression of serid CGE and LGE markers. The expression of some LGE markers, but low expression of the um, medium spiny neuron marker FOXP1. And um, first, I'll focus on this FOXP2 TSHC1 class, which is found in both our cortical sampling, but also in our subcortical and striatal um, sampling, and which correlated with a cell type found in mouse ventral telencephalon. Um, next slide. And so here's a picture of the anatomy. I'll use some of those marker genes and their co-expression or co-immune reactivity um, and, and along with this anatomy to follow the origin and migration of these populations. Um, so you can see that this, um, these classes of inhibitory neurons are 
the, the markers are expressed along the dorsal LGE here. And um, if this is more of a kind of dorsal lateral portion of it, if we go to the next slide, um, first focusing on this TSHC1 class, when you look at the UMAP, and, and you're not supposed to do this, um, but it looks like this TSHC1 class is almost converging with the direct and indirect medium spiny um, projection neurons, and which are generated in the ventral LGE. And we wanted a way to ask this more quantitatively. Um, is this class born in a distinct place, but then converging on a similar transcriptional program? Um, next slide. And to do that, this is a heat map of the overlap in activating genes in the upper right and inactivating genes in the lower right along the trajectory of differentiation. And what we can see is these direct and indirect medium spiny neurons, we can distinguish them even in progenitors. We can see different co-expression signatures, but they follow very you know, parallel tracks in the UMAP, and that is you know, more quantitatively reflected. They activate very similar genes, and they inactivate very similar genes as they differentiate. Um, this TSHC1 class, on the other hand, it also overlaps quite strongly in the genes it activates with uh, the direct and indirect, but it inactivates a different set of genes and appear to diverge from the MICE2 PAC6 class. And so you can see that here, uh, the overlap of activating genes is quite strong between the THCC1 class and the medium spiny projection neurons and, and quite a bit lower for the MICE2 PAC6 class. Um, and so what are the genes that are activated and inactivated? This class is uh, inactivating the signatures of its dorsal LG origin. So when it gets to the striatum, its dorsal LG origin may almost be camouflaged in a sense. And at the same time, it's upregulating these projection neuron programs. Um, and some of these markers corresponded to um, a recently discovered cell type, um, these eccentric spiny neurons that um, were thought to be a deviation of direct uh, medium spiny neurons. But our data led us to hypothesize they're actually specified in a distinct place and converge along this trajectory. And so to look further at that, we zoomed in at the dorsal LGE here and asked, can we already see these medium spiny neuron genes um, turning on? And uh, next slide. And we can see many examples of TSHC1 overlapping with CASZ1. And then OPRM1 turns on later in differentiation in this class, but we can already see some examples here in the dorsal LG before these neurons get to the striatum. Um, next slide. In addition, this transcription profile looked a lot like a profile found in the amygdala, these intercalated cells of the amygdala. Um, and Kenneth Campbell's lab um, had some elegant studies in mouse describing this THC1 migratory stream um to the amygdala forming these intercalated cells and, and we can see this stream here as well in primate and based on the the continuity of migratory streams in, in that last slide and, and transcriptional profiles led us to suggest that these are actually the same initial class migrating to multiple populations but in our sampling we found that class in the cortex and so do we also see these neurons migrating to the cortex and that was in macaque you could see it and also in uh in human, you can see these cells, and it looks like they're migrating to uh, superficial white matter, um, this uh, eccentric spiny neuron-like signature in, in primate cortex. And we, um, it's very rare, but we have not yet seen that population in, in rodents. Um, next slide. Um, in addition, this class also migrates to the olfactory bulb, and it looks to us that these uh, dorsal LGE-like cells that express SP8 and FOXP2, but not the CG marker NR2F2, merge with the rostral migratory stream here, um, or, or merge at least with the stream to the olfactory bulb to go to the periglomerular layer. And so I've gone into a lot of detail and jargon about these different cell types, because this TSHC1 class is a great example of a single initial class that radiates broadly to many different regions of the telencephalon. And when we think about it from an adult or terminal class perspective, we're considered to be different cell types. But at least the same transcriptional program, it's hard to say without lineage tracing the exact same progenitor, but the same transcriptional program generates this diverse array of cells and is also generating a white matter population in primates. Um, so then returning to this other class that looks uh, transcriptionally quite similar to adult born granule cells of the olfactory bulb. And when we look in the primate brain, 
indeed, we see the markers of this class um, in the rostral migratory stream forming parenchymal chains. Um, but when we take a coronal section here, next slide, um, we also see the same parenchymal chains radiating out um, at the head of the caudate into the cortex. And so this set Matthew off on a sort of search, where are these going in, in the cortex? And um, this is about three or four weeks after cortical neurogenesis has uh, stopped for excitatory neurons. But, um, and the anatomy is a little challenging here. The dorsal LGE wraps around the head of the caudate. So you can see the remnant, the rostral migratory stream here, but you can also see dorsal LGE cells here migrating um, medially towards the cingulate cortex. And um, next slide. We um, see these cells are actually bounded by Th positive fibers, um, likely coming from the ventral midbrain, and we only see them interior to these fibers. Um, we don't actually see Th expression in these cells themselves. And I'm going to come back to the Th. It's very sparse here. The size of the circle corresponds to the fraction of cells, and the color corresponds to the intensity. But um, <laughs> the Th was highly specific um, uh, for this population. So we'll come back to that. Now, if we take an oblique horizontal section, we can see that these cells are also migrating caudally towards posterior cingulate cortex and maybe even um, further caudal. And they're also forming these same parenchymal chain-like structures that are used um, to reach the olfactory bulb in rodent. Um, next slide. And so what about in human? Um, this one sagittal section summarizes, I think, quite well what we're seeing. There is this ancestral distinct migratory stream to the olfactory bulb. But we see the same class of neurons expressing MICE2 and SP8, um, also forming this arc migratory stream recently described in primates by Mercedes Paredes and Arturo Alvarez Bulia. And Matthew identified this offshoot of the arc. Um, we're calling the arc interior cingulate cortex that we saw in the last slide. Um, so where do these cells end up? Um, cells expressing this combination of markers um, end up in the deep white matter of cingulate cortex. Um, and do we see these in mouse? Uh, next slide. Um, in mouse, you can find this population. And there's a beautiful study with an HTR3A reporter mouse line um, that shows you actually um, see this population in uh, the deep white matter and deep in the white matter and deep cortical layers in mouse. But you don't see the same histologically distinct migratory stream. And next slide, we see in our sectioning that the vast majority of these cells are in the rostral migratory stream going towards the olfactory bulb in mouse. And so that suggests a model to us where there's a conserved initial class of neurons that forms a primate-specific um, and histologically distinct migratory stream to reach the deep white matter. And in rodents, it's only a few cell bodies um, from the dorsal LGE to the white matter and um, deep cortical layers. But in primates, these cells have uh, increased their abundance and forms these very um, distinct migratory streams. Um, next slide. So I wanted to come back, or Matthew wanted to search further for these uh, TH positive neurons that we saw a signature of early in development. And we looked now postnatally. Here's the remnant rostral migratory stream. Um, I think we skipped a slide, maybe. Um, and you can see these same TH positive cells. You can see a fraction of these cells are expressing TH. And then in the next slide, here in the olfactory peduncle, you can see um, many TH positive cells. And um, cells with this molecular signature. Um, go on to form the TH periglomerular cells in the olfactory bulb and traverse the olfactory peduncle. But Matthew looks very closely at this section. And um, if you go to the next slide, we'll look at the claustrum and found these examples <coughs> in the claustrum of these uh, um, TH positive uh, mice 2 secretagogue and paxic cells um, very sparsely in the striatum and, and in the claustrum. And then next slide, um, along the striatum, these almost formed a wreath or boundary around the striatum. And um, so Matthew has called these the striatum laureatum neurons um, for this wreath that they form. And uh, so when do they get there? When do they mature? Um, next slide. They um, reach the edge of the striatum at day 120, which is already quite late, you know, three or four weeks after cortical neurogenesis. 
But even at this stage, we don't yet see the processes. So they arrive and mature quite late in, uh, in uh, telencephalon development. Next slide. And um, so what about in humans and do they persist throughout life? Um, we, here's a 88 year old, uh, a section from an eight year old brain sample. And you can see these in the external capsule and along the stratum in humans as well. Um, next slide. And do we see these in rodents? Um, we see the expression pattern for this or the immune reactivity for the, of this combination in the olfactory bulb and um, olfactory peduncle, but we never see it along the striatum um, or in the clastrum. And that suggests to us it's human specific. And so to summarize this section, um, we, we suggest there's a kind of triple homology that these um, deep white matter um, neurons in humans um, come from a homologous initial class to the adult born granule cells that represent the vast majority of adult neurogenesis in rodents. Um, next slide. And that these stridomolar autumn neurons uh, appear molecularly homologous to these PAC6 TH positive paraglomerular cells of the olfactory bulb that are actually dopaminergic. Um, and then coming back to the TSHC1 class, um, this class radiates to generate a diversity of cell types um, in stridum, amygdala, and even in primate white matter. Um, and it looks to be homologous to the other class of periglomerular cells, these calbine in one box P2 cells. Um, so to summarize that model in terms of the migratory streams, there are these streams shared with rodents um, of these three populations to the olfactory bulb, as well as the eccentric spiny neurons that are conserved between primates and rodents. But then there are also these um, potentially primate specific um, ESPN like cells in the superficial white matter. Next slide. And there are um, these deep white matter neurons where there's a homologous class in rodents, but not a homologous migratory stream. And we don't see them at the same abundance. And then finally, there are these primate specific uh, stratum laureatum neurons. Um, and next slide. And so this would represent to us this kind of second model of it's a conserved initial class of neurons that um, is shared between primates and rodents but it is being moved to primate specific locations where it may adopt new gene expression signatures and, and functions. And, and one of the things that as Matthew finishes his PhD, we're really excited about is trying to explore <clears throat> when along these migratory streams, this mice two pack six initial class um, differentiates um, based on destination. Um, next slide. And so why might these olfactory bulb neurons be redistributed? And, we're calling this a kind of reduce and reuse hypothesis that the relative reduction of the olfactory bulb compared with the dramatic expansion of the cortex and underlying white, white matter, as well as the dorsal LGE progenitor zone that sits adjacent to the cortical excitatory neuron progenitors um, may allow for these neurons to be co this initial class to be co-opted for new functions. And next slide. Um, and you know we often think about cortical expansion in terms of the expansion of neuron number and, and gray matter, but the white matter has expanded super linearly compared with the gray matter and is the latest to mature region of our brains, taking several decades to mature in the prefrontal cortex. And we find it very interesting that the same initial class of neurons that <clears throat> is evolved in plasticity of the olfactory bulb and the major source of adult neurogenesis, um, that that same initial class is redistributed um, to white matter regions of, of the enlarged primate brain. Um, and so together so far, I've presented uh, these two contrasting examples of, uh, of cell type evolution. Um, in the first case, um, a unique transcription factor code specifies a qualitatively distinct initial class of neurons, these TAC3 neuropeptide expressing neurons. And in the second case, um, a conserved initial class of newborn neurons is redirected to um, a new location, um, particularly these um, stridum laureatum neurons. Um, next slide. Um, given how rare it is to see a qualitatively distinct initial class um, and how common post-mitotic fate refinement appears to be from initial classes to terminal classes, we would predict that post-mitotic fate refinement due to extrinsic factors could be a potential source of uh, species specific uh, cell types as um, these as the cortex and other destination regions have elaborated in evolution.
Um, but um, we also think that uh, new cell types are likely very rare in more recent human evolution since our divergence with a, from a common ancestor with chimpanzee. And so in the remaining time that I have, I'll talk about some of the strategies we're using to study the evolution of conserved cell types. Um, and this would be um, changes in gene networks and conserved cell types that teaching old cell types new tricks. And um, so in our lab, we're still interested in potential causes of, of cortical expansion. And, you know, I know people in this audience have done seminal work in this area as well. But we're also interested in these trade-offs and, and the costs of large brains. And in combining, you know, these comparative single cell genomics approaches with evolutionary genetics approaches, where we might decode, um, not yet, um, where we might decode the adaptations of specific cell types to um, this large brain environment. And uh, okay, now, so one of the places that we, we think this uh, trade-off from unequal scaling may be most strongly manifest is, is the ventral midbrain. Um, next slide. Um, these, a few hundred thousand um, ventral midbrain dopaminergic neurons form these vast projections to um, striatum and as well as to cortex. And their targets have expanded disproportionately with their source number. If you compare a human brain to a rhesus macaque brain, the volume is about 17 times greater, but there's only two or threefold increase in number of these neurons. And so we're exploring the hypothesis that these neurons could represent a, a vulnerable joint. And in, in addition to this unequal scaling, um, there's some studies suggesting that there's increased innervation to certain areas like the medial caudate um, in humans, even compared with uh, chimpanzees and, and gorillas, that these innervation could be related to increased pro-social behaviors or, or flexibility in humans. So the combination of unequal scaling and new functional requirements could potentially create these, uh, these vulnerable joints. And these neurons themselves, uh, next slide, um, have these incredible cellular specializations where their axons, single axon can be over a, a meter long, these bushes in the striatum, and they have very high energetic demands. They have uh, pacemaker activity um, and, you know, very high calcium flux. And we want to test the hypothesis. Are there, you know, cell intrinsic changes that would increase connectivity in humans as compensation or for new functional requirements? And also, are there compensatory adaptations that allow these neurons to take on greater energetic burdens? And could these compensatory adaptations point to potential targets or, or therapeutic factors um, that we could further harness? Um, and next slide. And, you know, we're interested in these neurons as well because they're involved in these disorders that are enriched in humans and, you know, rare or absent or even impossible to define in other, other species. Um, so. Next slide, how do we, how can we study human specific changes in ventral midbrain populations? And for this, um, this is the first time I'm discussing this project. Um, we're really lucky to have uh, Sara Nolbrandt join the lab. She trained in, uh, in the Parmar lab where she developed um, some excellent uh, dopaminergic neuron uh, protocols that are now entering clinical trials. And in our group, she's established this uh, phylogeny in a dish where we can generate um, dopaminergic neurons and ventral midbrain neurons from human, chimpanzee, orangutan, and, and rhesus macaque. Um, next slide. And with this, we're trying to test this hypothesis. Is this a case of teaching old cell types new tricks? And um, based on, you know, these combination of trade-offs. And next uh, slide. So we want to ask, have cell intrinsic changes in connectivity, gene expression, and bioenergetics evolved in these dopaminergic neurons? And this is a project that is in progress very much. Um, for the connectivity questions, next slide, Sara has generated these um, assemblage models where we can culture ventral midbrain from one species with cortex or striatum from another species and compare the intrinsic and extrinsic influences on connectivity. Um, we're also looking at this from the gene expression evolution perspective, next slide. And for this, it, it's such a challenge to do large sample sizes um, with these comparative IPS projects, but we're also really interested in cell intrinsic um, changes. So we are culturing um, intraspecies and interspecies pools and organoids um, where we can 
really tease apart intrinsic and extrinsic factors, as well as scale up to many individuals. Um, so Sara has made these pools now of 17 individuals from four species. Um, next slide. And um, here's a look at her protocol. Um, here's a, these are from interspecies example. So this is the 17 individuals here, and we can get very, um, you know, very um, specific ventral midbrain patterning. Next slide. Um, we can follow these organoids through development, and we have uh, strong uh, TH immune reactivity, particularly um, in fibers that bound the, the organoid. Um, next slide. And we can take these out 100. I think she's taken them out to 200, 250 days. Um, next slide. And um, we can start to look at the cell type diversity and start to compare gene expression divergence across species. And just really quickly, um, here's an example um, at day 40. Um, there's about 20,000 cells from uh, human and 28,000 from chimpanzee. This is from two independent replicates. And I should say in both our replicates, we only started with one macaque and one orangutan individual. And they seem to have differentiated. They patterned correctly, but they differentiated earlier um, such that they're quite underrepresented at this stage. And um, on, on the other hand, we, um, we have relatively even representation. Um, we managed to keep the seven or eight human individuals through this stage and at least six of the chimpanzee individuals. Um, so the human and chimpanzee cells actually um, culture well together and maintain their representation. And this is a UMAP projection. We have not uh, aligned the species just for the purpose of showing you human versus chimpanzee, um, but um, the cells do align quite easily with standard methods like uh, batch balance carrying nearest neighbors. And so these cells show markers of the neuronal lineage. Um, here's the progenitors on this side and the differentiating neurons on this side. Next slide. And you can see here that we've captured a, a significant proportion to represent this LMX1A lineage. Um, and if we follow this through, we can see markers of maturing dopaminergic neurons in both human and chimpanzee um, for all these markers. Interestingly, we have a branch or this or a pass here that is the ventral midbrain dopaminergic neurons. And then we also have a subthalamic nucleus neurons in both human and chimpanzee. So we're sampling more of the ventral midbrain diversity. Um, but that will let us ask uh, whether specific cell types have been substrates for uh, gene expression changes and to really isolate the specific uh, changes in the dopaminergic neurons. Next slide. Um, right, next slide. Yeah. Um, all right, next slide. And um, so, you know, if we do the simplest analysis, just principal components across the time points along this LMX1A lineage, we can see that the major axes of variation relate to differentiation from the almost pure progenitors at day 16 to maturing neurons. Interestingly, there's still some progenitors at day 100 that may be stalled or you know, may retain neurogenic potential at that stage. Um, and then the second axis of variation relates to species. And you can see the few orangutan and macaque cells that are, are in these initial runs. So we are you know, repeating this now. Um, and we can see um, here, you can see these kind of conserved maturation trajectories, the sequence of expression you would expect um, as these neurons differentiate. Um, but then next slide, we can also identify species specific changes. You know, here's an interesting example of shared expression in the progenitors, but then uh, specific, uh, specific. I think this one is actually a down regulation. No, yeah, this is a human specific down regulation um, in this case. And, um, and right now we're focusing on genes influencing calcium buffering and physiology, and, and we're seeing some enrichments um, here that you know, potentially could support um, you know, the initial hypothesis, but it's still early in this analysis. Um, next slide. And so I wanted to talk about this as an example of how we think about studying the evolution of cell types um, um, along the human lineage um, after divergence with apes. And so we are taking these comparative approaches using iPS-derived cell lines, and we have found that the gene expression divergence we see in the iPS lines corresponds and overlaps quite well with gene expression divergence we observe in primary tissue samples between human and macaque. And the, the primary tissue validation is important to us. We've also found um, that we can really find tissue-specific gene expression changes. About 85% of the changes we saw previously in cortex 
we would not have found looking at just IPS or fibroblast. We can use this data to identify intersect with candidate mutations influencing genes with specific expression profiles. Um, here's a splicing change that we previously found in a regulator of mitosis. Um, and also to try to identify candidate pathways that differ between species. And in this latest project in progress, we're looking at the evolution of selective vulnerability through this lens. And we've mainly focused on gene expression. Um, next slide. Um, but, you know, we'd really love to expand to other multimodal accounts of species differences and get to cell behavior and physiology. And um, the Taverna lab over here is, you know, kind of leading the way and looking at the comparative functional maturation of these in vitro derived neurons using um, these types of methods. And, um, and then to try to couple that as best as we can with primary tissue validation. And that's why, you know, collaboration and, and using these clinical samples becomes so valuable as a ground truth or correspondence for the in vitro models. And then, you know, the other strategy we're taking that I didn't have time to talk about today, um, but uh, next week potentially we'll talk about is um, using genome engineering strategies to study um, human specific changes in the appropriate genetic and cellular context using these models. And uh, next slide. Um, and so with that, I want to acknowledge um, the people who did this work and, you know, Matthew, who's here in the audience, really shaped the evolution of inhibitory neuron project. He had the idea for these patterns and really led all aspects of it. Um, we're fortunate to collaborate um, with uh, his co-mentor, Jimmy Yi, on some of the computational analysis and Tom Nowakowski. Um, and then with, we're so lucky to be next to Mercedes Peretti's, who identified the ARC migratory steam originally, and um, with her student, Caitlin Sandoval. And then um, Sara Nolbrandt is, is leading the dopaminergic uh, neuron uh, comparative project. And um, Brian in the lab, I think, has generated He's in large panels of iPS cells previously from his work in have Galad's lab that are widely used. And in our own lab, he's also expanded these panels. Um, and then Sophie Salama um, at UC Santa Cruz, um, who generated the orangutan lens, and then uh, the whole lab. Um, so thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, apologies for some of the, the tech mishaps here, but uh, I think we got through it. You hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Alex. So this uh, wonderful seminar for presenting such exciting data, including a lot of unpublished work. So thanks a lot. And uh, the floor is open for questions. Oliver. Wonderful uh, presentation, Alex. Really enjoyed it. Um, particularly interested also in the latter part and potentially also, you know, my own uh, background, as you may know. I was curious, based on uh, the selective vulnerability uh, hypotheses, uh, two questions, essentially. So as you have kind of the ground truth, as you say, right, in the primary tissue, you can make comparative analyses in vitro compared to the primary tissue. Do you see um, the true diversity of, of dopaminergic neurons within the eventual midbrain? So A9 versus A10 specific dopamine neurons, because obviously there's a selective vulnerability between those subtypes. And then while I, the, the change and expansion is obviously an interesting question, I think evolutionary, but I was curious from a clinical perspective, um, as far as I understand, there's actually quite a lot of redundancy in the amount of cells within the ventral midbrain before Parkinson patients develop symptoms, right? So I think we know from transplantation studies that you can lose up to half of your uh, dopaminergic neurons within the midbrain before you become symptomatic. So is, is there uh, perhaps a um, selective vulnerability or a problem in scaling in specific subtypes, or is it a connectivity? Um, how do you see that kind of within the hypotheses like this, that you can actually lose so much of your midbrain dopaminergic neurons before becoming symptomatic? Um, all right, thank you for the question. So the first question, um, how much of the diversity of dopaminergic neurons do we recapitulate in this culture system? And I think that question also gets into can we expect an in vitro system to recapitulate aspects of selective vulnerability that we might see um, 
you know, in vivo or in, in tissue. And, you know, we have some markers of A9 versus A10. We don't have control over that patterning yet in our protocol. And different lines vary. You know, we're doing 17 lines through this protocol. And different lines vary in their wind activation, which influences, you know, how caudal they are along the ventral floor plate. So we are actually doing, we're bracketing the wind exposure. So everything I showed you there was from three different, um, three different tier concentrations for wind activation. And so, you know, I believe we're spanning both identities. We still have, despite many cells sequenced and the majority of them being in the LMX1A lineage, we still have limited sampling of maturing dopaminergic neurons. So it's harder to um, see the full subtype diversity. There's this beautiful study from the McCosco lab, even showing a primate specific um, population um, in substantia nigra that expresses calbindin one. And it's hard for us to um, map to that diversity yet with our cell number. In terms of whether we would expect the in vitro system to recapitulate differences in vulnerability, you know, a challenge is how mature can the neurons get in vitro. Um, there's some arguments that yes, we can. So there's studies of explants of um, of actually our friends, the the TH periglomerular cells from the olfactory bulb versus substantia nigra explants, and in culture conditions where you dissociate and then culture those cells in vitro, you can indeed see differences in in the vulnerability. So, and you know, in, in our hands, we we can do these you know known treatments or other bioenergetic stress treatments, and we can see selective vulnerability of the TH neurons compared with other cells in the organoid. Um, so I think it is possible to model this in vitro. I, I do think there are some limitations to the maturation of these neurons. The nice thing about the ventral midbrain compared with the organ cortex is these do mature more quickly um, you know, than the, the cortical neurons. Um, and then you know, the other question is, you know, I, I've talked about this unequal scaling of, of uh, the volume of targets with the number of neurons themselves, but you know the, the volume of targets is also going to influence the overall axonal arborization and axon length. And you know the, the question is there, there's a reserve. It's not like we're on a knife's edge. And you know I, I, I would argue that um, you know the most recently evolved traits are often vulnerable to dysfunction, but there already are compensatory adaptations such that it is not generally pathological in the population, especially pre-reproduction. So if you know people with, you know, knee problems or back aches or worried about childbirth or had wisdom teeth out, um, you know, all these things relate to recently evolved traits like bipedalism, changes in pelvic morphology or, or brain size. And, you know, the argument would be that the um, reserve capacity is lower and whether that is, you know, I think maybe simplistic to think of it in neuron number and probably more related to the you know, bioenergetic stress and arborization and the, you know, the, I found at least, you know, one example in the literature of a high penetrance mutation that could cause Parkinson's reported in a rhesus macaque colony, but the, the idiopathic cases and the common cases, you know, without great epidemiology, you know, in non-human primates, notwithstanding, you know, are far more rare and, and not observed. So I, you know, I, I do think that increasing strain has been put on this system, even in the last 6 million years and that the, IPS organoid models would, would give us a test kit to follow that up. But, you know, it's a hypothesis we're testing now. And I think, you know, we hope to functionally interrogate some of the genes that differ between species to see if they could answer some of these. I think there's two parts of it. There's cell intrinsic changes to accommodate more connectivity, potentially even more functional requirements for connectivity related to these. Um, you know, Marianne Rigonti has this uh, kind of dopamine driven hypothesis about human brain evolution and social conformity and, and then there's also just the the unequal scaling and weakness and so that we we are attempting to test both of those hypotheses with with the system um but it would be fun to drill down further on on that at the price of one so it's an incredibly cost effective uh, is that it thanks um it, it was uh, very exciting to listen to your talk. Thank you. The, um, I would have two unrelated questions. Let me first ask the first. And the, the um, so about the olfactory bulb, and uh, would you then try to correlate across all mammals, not just primates and uh, and and rodents, and not just carnivores, right? Like I mean, really all of them to see the if this uh, your hypothesis would hold true. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you. So the, the question is, we, we've put one possible explanation, um, this reduce and reuse hypothesis. Um, and so how do we test that further? And that's something Matthew is wrestling with now as he wraps up his PhD. And we're thinking about um, a few different ways of testing that, including some you know, functional experiments in, in, in rodent to try to kind of force the scaling, and then also um, a kind of comparative association, you know, which isn't going to get to causation, but could add some support for it. And, and we're exploring both, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to get that many brain samples, um, especially at the stages when these streams are present, but uh, we're, we're working on it. Yeah, because ferret seems to have a huge olfactory bulb, if I remember just so. But yeah, it would be interesting to to test that. Okay, so the about the midbrain and, and the basically interspecies organized. I was uh, I was wondering there if uh, a very kind of technically, when you have so few macaque and orangutan uh, contribution, is it possible that the you know the conditions in which you grow organoids are very much human and chip favorable? And if so, could then, you know, what would interest me is could these extrinsic factors that then influence on cell fate could be different and differentially uh, affect the different species? Yeah, so the question, you know, has, has a few parts, but the, you know, have we optimized our culture methods, you know, for human and chimpanzee? And is, is that depleting the macaque and orangutan? And then another layer of that is, you know, are there some signals, you know, and I think, uh, you know, there's studies of competition between species and in chimeric culture that, that are ongoing now um, from, you know, Jun Wu's lab, for example. And, you know, could it be that there are, you know, human to human or human or hominid, maybe promoting factors that are, are not there for the rhesus macaque? I, I will say in the lab, we've worked very hard to build a new stem cell medias and, and differentiation conditions from the ground up that are optimized to work across species and to reduce variance um, within species. Um, and when I started this doing the reprogramming, I was using the human protocols and my human positive control always worked great. And I really struggled. And, um, you know, so we, we've taken a lot of time to uh, rethink that. And if you grow, we grow these in isolation and the, the macaque and orangutan organoids grow really well. But I don't think it's a fair comparison um, because in these first uh, couple of runs, we only had one individual from each of those species. And so we only seeded them at maybe 10% of all the cells. So stochastic factors or other things could have influenced the loss. And so it's something we're repeating now in the additional replicates. And I'll get back to you. But I, I will say those, they, even, even in this case, they still patterned properly. Um, but they, they grow very well, you know, when separated. But I, I wouldn't conclude yet that there's some sort of competition based on, you know, only performing this twice and they're being underrepresented in the initial start. We, we did a more even proportion by individual rather than by species. Um, we were most focused on the human chimp comparison to start before we go to isolate what's derived on the human lineage. And we wanted to make sure we had that representation. Okay, thanks. So the force is related to the ventral midbrain and uh, this idea of uh, this uh, higher innervation of the dopamine neurons being uh, one of the underpinnings of prosociality. And I was wondering, first of all, what you think is the best evidence for that? And uh, if you think about Parkinson, well, of course, depending on the progression of the disease, there are, of course, uh, elements of social restriction, but which are usually thought to be secondary to the other symptoms of the condition rather than primary feature. So I was wondering what we, what, what your thoughts were thinking about uh, this higher innervation of dopamine neurons as a correlate of prosociality. And the, the second question relates to the last part of the talk, which was also very uh, interesting. And uh, I was wondering whether, I mean, as you know from when we in initially spoke in Cosmic Harbor, we've been doing a lot of multiplexing uh, among different individuals uh, in organized paradigm. And so I was wondering to which extent you always see a more or less even distribution among individuals of the same species. And if you have sort of benchmarked uh, 
how often, especially at very advanced stages, uh, you actually maintain uh, the distribution of individuals that you had uh, at the beginning of culture. Thanks. All right. So the, the, the first question is, what is the there, there's this intriguing uh, dopamine driven brain evolution hypothesis. And you know, there are, if you look at the fossil record, it, you know, it suggests that human sociality predated a lot of the brain expansion that has been observed um, in terms of you know, group sizes or reduction in sexual dimorphism. And so that suggested that maybe there were some driver mutations in social conformity and a social affiliation that were kind of prerequisites for additional changes in brain expansion. And so what what is then the evidence for the, the social conformity side? So there's you know, neurochemical evidence in the ratio of dopamine and serotonin levels and innervation to norepinephrine compared across humans and great apes that suggest uh, lineage specific changes. And then there's some limited evidence for increased dopaminergic neuron innervation in, in certain brain regions. But, you know, I think there's these experiments are tremendously difficult to get matched samples between human and non-human primate and similar postmortem intervals. And just to quantify these um, features that are really hard to quantify. And, you know, our hope is that, you know, an orthogonal method using, um, you know, stem cell derived neuromodulatory neurons might give us insights um, from the gene expression and even causal genetic change level ultimately one day as a field, which could then be linked back to test this hypothesis through additional methods. Um, on the technical question, we are we were very worried to invest this much money in single cell sequencing as, as a young lab. Um, that we would be sequencing just one individual and actually our orangutan line grows really well and we were especially worried that one was going to take over um we did uh we pre-screened all the lines for p53 mutations we cultured many but not all of the lines to establish that they had roughly similar growth rates and patterning for density sara did her a heroic amount of work to get to this point uh, it's really amazing and speaks to the training she already had um, you know, before she joined the group from the Parmar lab. And um, the representation, what I was amazed about is the representation of the human and chimp cells um, was almost identical to the starting conditions, especially in our second replicate. Um, you know, I think out of the eight humans, th there's a distribution. They're not perfectly evenly represented but they're all retained through day 40. Um, the chimpanzees, I think we lost one individual and another one is much lower representation, but the, um, some of that speaks to intensive pre-screening that we did in terms of, you know, we didn't want P53 null lines or, you know, um, lines with strange growth rates, but also, um, you know, we, we had a larger panel of lines to choose from thanks to Brian and his heroic efforts. Um, reprogramming these and also optimizing media, the state of the cells when you start the differentiation is so important. Um, and, you know, I think uh, how we actually do the pooling. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was certainly nerve wracking when we were doing the demultiplexing. You know, if, it, if it just ended up being an experiment on human or something after all that work, and, you know, we did some validation at a time, but, you know, it's, uh, I think it is a uh, really exciting frontier and, you know, for folks in this room where human genetics meets uh, stem cell biology and a lot of the problems of scale that have challenged us, um, you know, in, in the last decade in this field are, you know, going to be met, including through the pooled culture approaches. So the population in a dish and phylogeny in a dish approaches are, you know, extremely exciting and really get at the kind of promise of the genetics, especially the genetics of cell intrinsic differences. Um, and, you know, I, I tried growing organoids from 20 different lines as a postdoc and you know, man, it was hard to do an array format from a technical perspective and it's kind of whack-a-mole with different individuals keeping up, so. Then, if not, uh, we thank you again a lot, Alex, for this wonderful visit. Oh, Great thank science. you, everyone.